So, does this work? Yes. Uh, good, good morning to the second day of Expanded Animation Symposium, the 10th edition as far as I know. And uh, I'm happy to be the moderator in the morning session. And this morning session is called uh, ASIFA Austria Forum. And at first, I'd like to welcome the president and chairman of ASIFA Austrian stage. He will tell you about ASIFA and Austria a few sentences. Thank you very much and good morning. Um, ASIFA is an international association of animation filmmakers, very traditional, exists since 60 years internationally, and ASIFA Austria, the Austrian chapter, uh, exists already more than 35 years. So for the first time, uh, we are really connected to the AS Electronica, two organizations beginning with an A, ending with an A, but that's not the, uh, uh, the real reason for the connection, but we are friends in spirit for many years. Uh, Jürgen Hagler, uh, the curator of Expanded Animation, is a CIFA member, also Reinhold Biedner. Uh, they both uh, curated this panel for ASIFA Austria and AS Electronica. And we are completely delighted to have this collaboration because as uh, Austria in general, as you may have noticed, is very goes into a direction of a kind of expanded animation, not so much industrial, but also. And so things find together. And I wish you all a very pleasant uh, morning and day uh, here at Expanded Animation with ASIFA Austria and uh, AS Electronica. Thank you very much and uh, have fun. <laughs> So for that, for that panel, um, we thought that it's, yeah, we tried to find some positions that make sense for ASIFA and Expanded as well. And in that sense, I'm happy to introduce my first two, the, the first two speakers um, who will talk about the art of Creek, their game. Both are based in Czech Republic, in Brno and Prague. Uh, Jan Klub, is that correctly? And Radim Jurda, The Art of Creek from An Amanita Design. Okay, uh, thank you and good morning. Uh, so, and I think let's just uh, start it because we have, uh, the talk is quite long and we have to rush a little bit to, to tell you everything we want to tell you. Uh, so my name is Radim Jurda, and I am a <coughs> lead designer and artist of Kriegs, which is the game from Amanita Design Studio that uh, was released 2020. Uh, yes, and my name is Jan Klub, and I worked on a Kriegs uh, mostly on a paintings and on a graphics. And yeah, Radim is going to start. Okay, and uh, I would like to ask, like, if some of you already played Kriegs or no? <laughs> Cool. <laughs> uh, so cool. We have some basic stuff, so it wouldn't be boring for you because, like, yeah, we tell some stuff like this. Um, we are from the studio that is called Amanita Design, and it's the studio that was founded by Budvorsky in 2003. And the studio is somehow like um, uh, it's coming from the traditional animation, and uh, like each of the games is trying to be really audiovisually interesting and uh, yeah, quite unique. There are like a uh, few small teams working on each of these games. Uh, it's like five to seven people or, or two to seven people. And uh, there are four teams at the moment and each of the team is working on its own game. So that's why we are able to somehow release one game per, per year or per two years. But the development of the games is much longer. And for example, in the case of Kriegs, it took us like from the first beginning, it was like eight years to finish it. But okay, we are the we have the record like in the longest development in the studio. Uh, yeah, and now um, 
we will hop to back to Greeks and I will play you the trailer for the game and then we will go back in time and we will talk about how we made all of this. Okay, so uh, now we are going these eight years back in time and um, I would just like to tell something about the theme of the game or how the idea was created. Uh, I was actually studying um, Academy of Arts, Architecture and Design in Prague uh, in the animation studio and uh, Jan was um, studying painting in Academy of Fine Arts, mm -hmm. right? And uh, when the time came for me to make my diploma, I decided to make a game or like a concept for the game. And in the time, I was somehow interested in visualization of human psychology and also interested in a situation if we see or know something just partly, our brain, our brain like fill the gaps and create some new reality for us. Which is a little bit complicated, but I was looking how to visualize it. And I remember the situation when you are in a dark room, similar to this, and you see in the corner, you can see some strange silhouette and it can remind you maybe some strange creature or a monster or something. But if you turn on the light, you see it's not a monster. It can be just like a harmless piece of furniture or uh, maybe stand coat with some clothes on it, something like this. And uh, we kind of like this idea and uh, we created these shape-shifting creatures. This is like the first sketch of one of our basic um, enemies. And so it's like a dangerous dog in the, in the darkness, in the shadow, and like a harmless nightstand in the light. And uh, I like this idea because it was interesting also visually, and it could like create some interesting visuals and world. And also it was, I thought it's potent for interesting puzzles to have these strange shape-shifting creatures and uh, like turn on the lights, turn off the lights, and somehow manipulate them in the way you like and solve the puzzles in this way. Uh, yeah, and I was I was also like designing the world for the game, and this is like one of the essentially the first sketch of the game environment, and I kind of like it because uh, like find a lot of things from this picture like made it to the final game, like the overall mood and this look of the hero, and yeah, this uh, lake inside the strange cave. I was also doing this uh, free drawings where like each one. On, on each of the drawings, I was trying to like um, realize something for me or try something for me. Uh, this is just the mood, like our hero is safely sleeping in the light and the monsters are like uh, crawling at him in the darkness. Uh, here our hero is meeting some NPC character. In this picture, I was trying to decide if it will be uh, the whole game will take place in underground city or underground house because I also like the mood of uh, abandoned public libraries and swimming pools and stuff like this. But in the end, we, uh, we decided to make it uh, just underground house 
because it's kind of intimate, it's also cool, and it's not so much work. Like we already did the house for many years, if it would be whole city, if we would be still working on it. Uh, and this is picture, uh, I kind of like this concept art, like um, because all of the important stuff are already in the picture. You see the hero, the avian character, lights, monsters, the cave in the background. We were also creating the story, and um, in the tradition of Amanita design, we decided to tell the story completely without words. So there is no talking language, also there is nothing written. Everything is expressed with animation. And so to do this, we made really, really long storyboard with 1,000 pictures, and like to draw each scene into really details, and then we were showing it to our friends. Uh, without any commentary, so to understand, like, if they just read the pictures, if they could understand the story. It's quite a simple story, but uh, we also cannot tell a very complex story if we are telling it only in animation. Uh, yeah, and this, uh, this initial ideas led us that we will uh, split the, the whole game world into several districts, uh, and each of the districts would uh, introduce one new enemy, new inhabitant of this district and, and a distinct visual style. Uh, I made three of these digital sketches and in each of the sketches I was really trying to find some uh, elements that I could repeat in, in, this, uh, in this environment and they could like create this distinct feel. So this is a sketch for attic full of uh, wooden creaky floors and old tools and yeah, dried herbs and garlics and stuff like this. Uh, this world is called Towers. Uh, it belongs to the, uh, to the character that is called Librarian, and it's full of libraries, full of books. Uh, it's inspired by Gothic architecture, and it has space and spiritual themes. This one is the most modern example. Uh, it's called Science Labs, I think. And this one is like inspired by cubistic architecture, functionalist thick architecture, and uh, for example, uh, we were, took inspiration also with uh, cubistic architects and furniture makers, so this one is, uh, for example, wardrobe inspired by Josef Gochar, Czech cubist architect. Uh, so yeah, and I was, when I was doing all of these, I was also designing the monsters itself, the creeks, so I have here some just free sketches, some notes, and here I have three examples. Um, each of the creeks is behaving differently according to our hero. The dog is chasing our hero. This uh, shadowy guy, we call him Spy, he's like mimicking his movement. So if our hero goes left, he goes left. If he goes right, this guy also goes right. And the jellyfish, uh, she actually just kind of floats around. But if she touches the hero, like he's over, he is done. <coughs> In this uh, slide, uh, we see the evolution of the hero uh, from the completely the first prototype we made uh, in the flesh until the final appearance in the game. Um, and uh, some, like for example, his clothes it didn't evol evolve at all; it just it stays the same all the time. But uh, what uh, changed the most is, uh, for example, his eye. It started just with one pixel and slowly get into quite big eyes and also the head in general got bigger and his hands, because we realized that uh, when we are making the cast scenes and animation, we cannot zoom so much in, and it somehow helped us to, um, to have these expressive body parts bigger, so it helped us to tell the story in a better way, like the characters could express themselves better like this. Uh, yeah, when I was designing the world, I also dis like realized that I need some like intelligent inhabitants of this place. Uh, and I was, because um, somehow uh, for the interpretation of the game, I would like, I, I kind of like, all, like both interpretations, like that our hero is like visiting really interesting fantasy world, but also it's, it can be also a little bit understand like uh, maybe his introspective journey, maybe it's just happening in his head. And so I want him to be only human in the, in the game. So I was trying to find something else than humans for these uh, characters. And uh, yeah, I was trying different things. I was combining different animal parts. And 
somehow naturally like these bird figures were appearing on my drawings, but I was thinking like uh, it doesn't make sense, like birds cannot be underground, like it's just strange. But uh, I was thinking maybe badgers would fit there better. But then my colleagues uh, somehow, uh, um, yeah, like uh, convinced me that actually it's interesting, like uh, it's giving them nice de depth to these characters. It's actually cool to have birds underground. So I went for them, and this is the final designs of uh, our um, supporting characters. <laughs> yeah, and uh, like also during all this, I was doing some animation tests. I kind of like frame by frame animation. And in this crazy test, I was like thinking, oh, it would be cool maybe to like cut everything from the wood. So I made this frame by frame wood animation. I like that uh, how the light is reflecting on the character. But yeah, like it, <laughs> it was quite crazy. Um, then I went for uh, maybe this, I still like it. It's like a frame by frame aquarel test. I like this one. Uh, yeah, and okay. <laughs> and here, uh, as I was telling it, like the concept for Kriegs was my diploma. And so uh, I was presenting there some artworks and some ideas for the puzzles and also this video. And uh, this video has a short trailer and then some like examples of the scenes. I will just show you now the trailer for it to see how it was uh, during the um, school project phase, how it looked. We saw there also there was a different name, working name. We then changed it for Greeks, and uh, we were also thinking that uh, the game will be finished much, much sooner. So we a uh, little bit delayed in the end. Uh, but uh, okay, in the end, as I was telling you, we did this storyboard with a lot of cutscenes and stuff. Uh, we decided to actually use um, cutout animation uh, because it's maybe a little bit simpler, but. Uh, also, like if you would do all the animations, all the cast scenes in frame by frame, it would be like a lot of data, and the game would be like many gigabytes and too big. So it was also like quite practical for us to use the cutout animation. But as I like as I like the frame by frame, I was doing this uh, maybe some some parts like this uh, hunter stuff. It's like uh, growing up with frame by frame. Also, the changes of the monsters are done in frame by frame animation. And uh, each of them is like prepared f from the main characters. It's like around two, 200 uh, cutouts. Uh, he's prepared from all the sides, so he can do really, really everything we need. Uh, yeah, and this is a video from our animator, Pavel Pachta. It's a little bit showing the evolution of the hero, uh, of the hunter, from some designs and uh, to the final animation in the game. It's interesting, like Pavel Pachta. It, uh, he he was like experienced in stop motion puppet animation, and he actually never never worked uh, on computer animation before, so it was a new thing for him. He had to learn. Uh, yeah, we were using Unity for it for the animation like completely. So um, for the short animations it was fine, but for the longer it was crazy because it's not like basically animation software, and uh, if we had the cutscene that is like two minutes long and we change something. Like Pavel had to wait for five minutes till the keyframes like recalculate themselves, but he's like the most patient guy I ever met, so <laughs> he made it. Yeah, uh, you see the cut cutouts here, and now I will just like a little bit hop in time. Yeah, 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 yeah. Preparing this, and it looks in the the final animation looks like this then in the game. Right. Hmm. 
OK. Uh, here I'll tell you a few words about actually the backgrounds and scenes and puzzles in the game. Uh, so it's a, it's a puzzle game, and um, like actually each room is a puzzle that you have to solve and then continue to the other other part, other puzzle, other part of the house. And it usually started everything on my sketchbook where I did this crazy stuff that um, I just got maybe some idea and just try if it works like with my pen. And if I thought it works, I made a very simple storyboard uh, where I kind of like play the puzzle solution and in this, I already find some problems of it and made some iterations. And when this worked, uh, we give it to our programmer. He made a really basic prototype with um, really geometrical graphics. And we tested it if it really works. If it was OK, we start to uh, find the illustration for the background. And it was quite interesting because we, we knew the shape, how it should look. Uh, I call it like a visual puzzle that we knew the shape and we have to find something that is uh, natural, like organically looks nice, but maybe not too chaotic. It was quite fun. So I did some uh, ideas, some designs. In the, in the end, I like this one the most. So then I print it, uh, put it uh, on the light table on a paper, uh, then draw it with the ink and aquarelle in this uh, basic black and white drawing, then scan it. And uh, in computer, we made some post-production, add colors and other things. And uh, this is the final look of the level in the game. Yeah, I, I, in this part, in this phase, I did quite a lot of these drawings. I have here some more examples. Some other levels. This is some part in the light. Some tower. And actually, like a lot of these drawings was created. And it was a nice work, but it was really, really time consuming very much. And uh, for example, also we made some mistake maybe in the puzzle that it was somehow you could stuck and cannot continue. So we have to repair it. So it was it meant like to draw it, print it, redraw it, then scan it again, and maybe somehow to uh, adjust it into the already existing picture. So it was quite crazy. And so we decided to try to make things uh, partly digitally, like to combine digital drawing and uh, like scanned uh, aquarelle textures. Because the, the characters are done like this already, and so we we decided to try it also with the background. This is the first background that uh, was created this way, and now I will give uh, microphone to Honza, and he will continue. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so I will talk about uh, digital how we did how we did <laughs> how we work on it uh, digitally, and then I will talk about the paintings. So. Um, we started to do the paintings, uh, the backgrounds digitally, and it was actually a huge time saver because before we worked on a one background for more than one month, and when we worked digitally, it was uh, much quicker. So it also allowed us to uh, work better with the depth in the level and also with the layers, and uh, any change was uh, much easier. Well, to achieve this, we've created uh, imitations of a uh, uh, pen tip that we used uh, when we worked on a paper. And we also made imitations of a brush. And here you can see a looped texture that we used as a background for the levels. So here's an, an image. Um, and you can see that we do the drawing as we would do on a paper. Um, yeah. And then when the drawing is done, we just add a, uh, some colors to it. We add some adjustments layers. And we are trying to. Um, to add a volume to the shapes and to add some spatial um, spatial depth to the level. So uh, to do this, uh, we set few post-production rules because, uh, in fact, it is we are two artists that are working on a on a one game, and uh, these rules are quite uh, important. So uh, because it is important to keep the like coherent visuals throughout the whole game. So, for example, I'm going to mention a few of these uh, post-production rules. Well, one of them is that that uh, the floor is always the brightest part of the of the scene of the level, and it is because it shows player where he can go and where he can step. And for example, the 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 ceiling or the area across the ceiling is always the darkest part. So, uh, yeah, and also we set a color palette. For example, in this case, uh, it is the stones of a green because this uh, level is in the area that is uh, dedicated to the character called Hunter, and he uh, likes the woods. <laughs> he likes green. 
he likes green. <laughs> yeah, and uh, if you play the game, you can see that uh, it is full of animated details in the background. So uh, we have to, uh, everything that moves in a game has to be created uh, or drawn separately uh, from the background and it has to be post-produced in a way so it looks like it fits. It was a bit tricky and it was also very time consuming and uh, to save some time we've created a uh, special tools, we programmed them to help us to export the, these cutouts more easily and uh, really speed the work up. And here you can see the, the animation timeline in the level. You can see uh, all the cutouts, all the frames for just one, uh, one object in the background for this mask. And actually there is like uh, more than 20 objects in this level. So it's, uh, yeah, it's really a lot of things to do. Um, well, uh, we, we did, uh, well, in the Greeks there are lights and light plays an important role. And actually in the beginning, as we were doing the things uh, on a paper, we were drawing the lights on a paper separately. And uh, yes, it was very time consuming. We had to scan it and so on. And then we decided to, that it looks, it looks okay if we do it just, uh, just in a computer. So we just add a uh, yellowish tones, yellowish colors, and we add some brightness to it. And it just works. So um, another time saving um, measure. Well, and uh, in our in our game, it consists of uh, many of these uh, of these drawings, and uh, you can see from one level to another. And it was quite tricky to to find out how how to do this, how to make it seamless. So uh, yeah, we just put all the all the levels in one big file, and we do all the adjustments uh, in here. So in the end, we have this uh, one big piece of work, one big illustration. And uh, yeah, and we actually got a five of these in the in the game, and it is easier to work with this. And this is the, how the level looks uh, when it's uh, when it's in the game. You can see there is there is a lot of layers of caves, like six layers, including fox, and uh, yeah, and lights, characters, and there is also this uh, frontal layer that we call front parallax, and it is this uh, dark area uh, that kind of frames the level. And uh, in fact, it moves slightly differently than the main camera, and it also helps create this uh, spatial, spatial effects, spatial illusion. So uh, yeah, I'm going to uh, show you just very briefly how we go about creating a level visually. So first, there's this uh, sketch in a prototype graphics. It looks like this. And then we have to come up with a theme and with the architecture for the level. So uh, mm, yeah, in this level, we do have these two characters, these two code, code stands, or these two, yeah, we call them code stands, uh, of opposite sex. And they do a kiss in the end of the level. Um, and uh, yeah, and so we were thinking about a theme. And we were thinking maybe it could be a house with a children's room and bathroom and bedroom, some intimate spaces. And we were thinking that maybe it may be a marriage feast of some kind. And in the end, we, we, we went with the jail. And uh, it is, uh, yes, these two characters just break out of, of the jail and they, they kiss at some meeting point. Uh, yeah, the level is about, hmm. yeah, the level is about like, uh, they, like helping each other. Uh, so it's quite fun that helping each other to escape from the jail and then they kiss if they manage. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah and here's a short video how, how, mm, how the level, mm, well, how we, um, <laughs> uh, how we think about the level, how we design the level, how we change it and how it uh, develops with all the layers in it. We're also trying to make the architecture kind of believable. So um, it's not it's not totally crazy. We're trying to make things look like it may work. And it gives us some kind of boundaries <laughs> in uh, thinking about the level. Yeah. So and I'm going to talk about the paintings. Actually, the Creeks is full of paintings. And um, in our game, it works as a collectible. I'm just going to tell you very briefly what a collectible is. Um, the collectible is something that you don't need to actually finish the game. It's some optional, it's something that is optional. And it is for those uh, players they, that love to spend a bit more time in a game. It's some kind of a reward. And uh, actually it, it often gives you some 
some hint of a history and a mythology, and that is exactly what our paintings in the game does. So these are one of the first paintings, and these were created uh, at the time when we didn't even know what inhabitants are going to be in the house. But we knew quite early on they are going to be these paintings, and maybe we are going to tell the story of the ancestors that uh, of the inhabitants that uh, live there. And uh, yeah, and at the beginning we didn't even know what technique to use to to make these paintings. We were thinking that using uh, ink ink in the paintings would be nice because the rest of the game is done in ink. But we also did some tryouts in different techniques such as gouache, acrylics, watercolors, and uh, yeah, and. Also, I'm showing you the frames because the frames play an important role in decision making about this. Um, we wanted to add a frame, so, so it's not just an image that you see on a screen when you play the game, but it is an object. It is something that uh, belongs to the house, it, that is a part of the house. And uh, adding the frames to the paintings, uh, to the image actually helps, helps with this. And we find out that the uh, frames done in oil looks, look the best. And, uh, that uh, help us to decide <laughs> if we're going to go with oil. But actually, oil is uh, also my favorite technique to use uh, in my art practice. And uh, for example, radium is ink. So, and we wanted to see these techniques uh, in uh, in this kind of media. So, in the in the video game, we want to see to see them alive. And also, the using oil painting is. Uh, Interesting also from marketing perspective because it's quite unique to see it in a video game. We don't know much video games that uh, decide to go with the oil just to, um, yeah, just as a, as a medium to use. And uh, yes, and um, the, as you see, the first paintings were this science fiction leaning characters, and we didn't like it that much because this science fiction is quite an obvious choice in a video game. It's not too original. We wanted to go with something, something, something more poetic, um, mm, something different. So uh, we know we didn't know too much when we started with the paintings, but we know one thing, and that was that there is going to be this uh, character called Hunter, this guy. And so I looked into famous hunt scenes, um, and I was interested in a, a British painting of uh, 18th and 19th century, and the genre painting. And uh, yeah, so, so uh, we get inspired, inspired in here. You can even see some Gainsborough, uh, Gainsborough uh, part in our, uh, just part of a Gainsborough painting in our, in our paintings, and Velasquez's painting in our paintings. And uh, yeah, we get inspired by children uh, book illustration and uh, by animated shorts. And when we combine it all together and we're creating this weird, uh, weird looking um, paintings. And actually our paintings are, um, take, very often take place outdoors and we call them these windows outside from the dark cave uh, because all the game takes place uh, underground and there is no sky, nothing. So we, we, we wanted to create something colorful, something that, uh, that has a different atmosphere just that takes uh, place uh, outside. And uh, yeah, the, the paintings, they do have an implicit connection to the game. It's uh, in this painting, you can see uh, the tree is a, is a tree that you can find in uh, one of the levels. And yeah, and it, uh, it tells a story. Actually, the paintings at a uh, level of complexity and also ambiguity to the to the mythology, to, to the mythology and history of the world. It just uh, makes it uh, <laughs> yeah sometimes more confusing and sometimes uh, yeah does a bit more. Well, actually, uh, coming. Uh, with the uh, working on the paintings, we have to we have we have few themes that we were working on. We were making sketches, and these are just a uh, few of them. And not all of them made it into into final game, but uh, yeah, but yeah, but uh, it was fun um, making these sketches. And I'm going to tell you very briefly how we go about making a uh, painting in a video game. Uh, the first, there is just a sketch, and it's just a sketch to 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 remember an idea just the draft, then we take it to a computer, we do some, um, uh, we, we, we think about the colors, about the composition, and we think about, um, over, about the painting uh, as a whole. And when the sketch is done, we do paint it, it's me doing that, and then we have to take a photo of it and get it back into the computer. And uh, this is how it looks uh, right after we import it into computer. And this is when we do the post-production. As you can see, the post-production is quite heavy because uh, it has to look good on a, on a display. And 
Yeah, and then there's another kind of paintings. We got aesthetic paintings, um, and then we got interactive uh, playable mini games. Actually, we find out that we've created a lot of these aesthetic ones, and we wanted something more interactive because it is an interactive media, and it just um, yeah, there was just a lot of them, and we were inspired by uh, automatons and these uh, and these things. And what we wanted, we wanted to make it. Uh, feel like a mechanic toy, like somebody can really, really make it. So it was a limitation, but it was a great limitation because uh, regarding the game design, it was uh, very simple because we have to be in the physical boundaries of, of this uh, mechanical object. And it's also good because of an uh, animation, because all the cutouts move only in a one on one axis so it's really uh, we really don't have to make a lot of a uh, lot of cutouts so there's also yes it's very similar as in aesthetic paintings there's a sketch there's a game design sketch which is very <laughs> very simple and then we do a prototype i program it and then uh, i check it with uh, with the team and see if it uh, if, if it works and uh, i also see as i do prototype i also see all the cutouts that we need to to animate it and this is this is the cutouts. You can see it's not a lot of them. It's a uh, it's a very production. Uh, it's uh, it's a good for production. It's it's easy to make. Yeah, there are covers. There is the background. It is a static one. And I'm going to show you a short video where you can see how uh, yeah, how it moves, how it develops. So this was interactive paintings. There's a lot of them, and then uh, the last thing about the paintings uh, it is that uh, you can see the static painting on the right, and uh, we were inspired by uh, working on um, uh, these interactive mini games. And in the beginning, we were scared to add something to the static painting, and uh, so we, <laughs> so we, yeah, uh, so we added some small animated details, um, yeah, to the static paintings. Well, I'm going to tell you something about the music. Actually, uh, there's a beautiful music in a game. It's done by Hidden Orchestra, AKA Joe Escherson. And the music in a Creek 6 is uh, adaptive and generative. Actually, uh, the, the music plays an important role uh, given the gameplay. Uh, it, uh, it, when you do something right in the puzzle solving, it gives you a hint that you're on the right track. So uh, you know that you're, you're doing something, uh, something good. Um, yeah. The, uh, actually, uh, in the end, we managed to stroke a deal with an apple, and it happened when the game was almost uh, finished, and we have to add some, uh, some, some, some features. For example, it has to be more widescreen, and uh, we add <laughs> touch controls and stuff like that. Um, and uh, uh, yes, and uh, it was released on the many platforms. Uh, uh, the Grip Digital was company to help us with that. And uh, yeah, and actually the work on Creeks doesn't end with the game release. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that we did after that. We released a book, um, some LPs, and uh, yeah, and collector boxes. And uh, we also create some other applications, for example, Creeks box that plays uh, music um, differently. And we are also working uh, on um, yeah, and there they may be some other projects that we may uh, work and, uh, and expand the world of Greeks, um, yeah, yeah, in the future. <laughs> well, <laughs> I've, that's it, that's it. Thank you, thank you very much for your patience. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you, thanks a lot. So maybe a, a quick Q&A during uh, setting up the the next speaker, is that okay? Um, and first, at first, you know, they talked already about it now. So they took those beautiful, Jan and Radim took those beautiful things with them. So this is a book, <laughs> maybe some of you still see. And also the, also the, the record, so I guess you are around and today. And okay, yeah, yeah, maybe, yeah. Like, maybe uh, we'll find a way that maybe people who are interested yeah if you would be interested like they are there 
uh, you can you can buy them from us. <laughs> Because yeah, they are quite heavy. So if somebody would board it, it would be cool. You wouldn't have to carry it back. <laughs> <coughs> Is there any questions? Uh, microphone of you or? You have my God, cool so. is here. Hello. Hello. <laughs> uh, thanks a lot for your talk. Uh, I really enjoyed your unique design. We tried for a few years to get you, and now we, you are here. We are, I'm pretty happy for that. Um, so one thing that really interests me a lot is how much time can you really invest? I mean, you, you talked something about eight years and uh, continuous work and so on. Are there other projects in parallel or does it mean that you're really super focused on one project? Of, yeah, during this time we were just like focused on this project, really. Like uh, it was a full time job for us. We were like in the beginning, it was five people working on a project. It was like two of us. And then we have the animator, one animator, one programmer, and one um, like supporting game designer and uh, dramatur dramaturgist for the game. So it would be like five of us. And we worked for it like maybe four years or something like this. And yeah. then, then the musician and the sound designer joined the team and then we continue on it. It was really like we didn't even have a holiday <laughs> during the time, <laughs> so it it was quite focused work. But it was interesting because, like for example, me, I I I, I didn't know it would be so long. So maybe if I would like imagine that I would be working on it for eight years, I maybe wouldn't even start. But I was always like thinking, ah, okay, we are or we are almost having it done. Maybe just like half of a year or one year, and we are finished. And this like moved like this. So this vision of like uh, to have it already done maybe keep me going. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. yes. So here was here was a second question. Hey, uh, a couple of technical questions. Have you uh, played with tools like Spine for your animation work? Y yeah, yeah, we've heard about it, but um, why we haven't used it? <laughs> I don't know. We we just uh, we just started with the Unity and. Uh, mm, we were scared that it may break something, and we changed uh, the the tools in the middle of development. So we wanted to stay with it, and we were hoping that maybe Unity will make it better. Every every year yeah, we were no. hoping, but they, <laughs> I think they made it better the last year when we were finishing. So. Uh, yeah, but we've made a lot of tools uh, along the way for our animator, so we made an, we made things easier for him as we were watching his workflow. Then we adapt a bit. So uh, another yeah. quick question: Are you using the auto generate tool in Photoshop to spit out your assets for your characters, things like that? No. Okay, I have to talk you, with you, you guys you after. Mean, you mean like to, to draw them for us or like... <laughs> no, basically to export. How do you export from Photoshop yeah. all, of, all of your assets? Yeah, yeah okay. Uh, so we've created a special tool. We've programmed it. And uh, yeah, it's uh, kind of sophisticated because uh, it's a work that we do with Radium, this uh, cutout export and uh, or this export of character and stuff related to, to it. And... Uh, yeah, and so we observed our workflow and created a tool that is specially f working for us. It, uh, for exporting. Yeah, yes, for exporting, because the exporter from uh, Photoshop wasn't good enough. It uh, were missing uh, a lot of things. Because, for example, we have to keep the squares around the, the area of an we cut out the same all the time, and the Photoshop was sometimes uh, three minute and uh, yeah, and much more and. Uh, yeah, and we got special adjustment layers, and we had to export it all together, and it works with the composition in Photoshop as well. So it's a special tool we've created, and we made better as we were, yeah, so we, we were giving ourselves a feedback how to make it even better, this tool. And so, yeah. If I get the chance, I'd like to go over in depth with, with you over that so stuff. Sure. Sure, sure. I guess you're still around yeah. sometime. Great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So because I, th I would say we, we should move on to stay a little bit in the schedule. So thanks a lot. Um, Thank you. <laughs> for the, all those insights. And maybe as a last comment, you will also have an exhibition in Bratislava, right? Which is, Bratislava is just close to Vienna, so go there if, or yeah, yeah. close to yeah. Linz maybe as well. Starting yeah. on the 1st of October. And last four months. So yeah, you can, you can see all these, these pieces like live. Uh, originals of the of our drawings and and things like this. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> Thanks a lot.
Thank you. Thank you. Well, I would like to introduce our next speaker, um, Michel Crano. And I think you're sort of set up, right? Okay. And. Uh, so, and to keep it short, her topic title is Expanded Animation with a Focus on Collaborative Processes. <laughs> so, maybe a little welcome to Michelle Crano. <clears throat> his computer, which doesn't seem to be responding so well at this point, because uh, I'm supposed to press slideshow in it. You think that one's better for me? I don't think so. I do. Hello? This one's better. This one's better, it's pink. Um, so it's gonna just connect while I do this. Um, you'll have to excuse me if my talk seems a little scattered. Um, it's the nature of what I do and who I am. Um, I would like to maybe, maybe first before I launch into my presentation and while it's considering whether it wants to be online or not. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Asifa Austria for making this possible and for uh, Alcidic Tonica and the Expanded Animation Symposium for inviting me. For you all who are here, uh, both in this room and remote, um, I want to thank uh, Jürgen for having arranged this and invited me and hopefully uh, we get to collaborate in the future. Um, I hope this works now. It's still trying to connect. See, I should have gone first because it was working. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll just say, I mean, it's true that I'm here. Um, alone, but I'm never really alone, uh, because I work together with uh, Uri, my uh, partner and co-director. That's why it says Michelle and Uri. That's Uri. Um, we met at an animation festival with our films and competition when we were students, and we've been making work together for 20 years. So all of the things that I will be presenting here are uh, collaborative projects with Uri. Um, I could also show it from the PDF, my backup. Okay, well, my next slide um, has a logo of the Animation Workshop. Um, I'm based in Denmark at the Animation Workshop in the Research and Development Center. Um, I run different programs at the Animation Workshop, but maybe I could tell you just a little bit about it. Um, the Animation Workshop is a school where we have different lines of bachelor education in graphic storytelling, in um, computer graphic arts and character animation. And we also run uh, professional training courses uh, from storyboarding to Houdini um, and everything in between. Um, one of the professional training courses that I run um, is called AnyDocs. You can see my little slides. You imagine like the miniature. Um, so AnyDocs is a program that Uwe and I have been... Uh, Yoni. Hello. 
This is my favorite animation director. I, I, did, I did remember to thank you in the beginning of my presentation. Yes. And thank you for your presentation yesterday. It was brilliant, and you didn't have any and of these tech. The computer worked. Um, it's just the, the internet. Well, I'm just going to, I'll just quickly tell you about the AnyDocs and then move into my personal works. Um, at the AnyDocs, um, I run a residency program, a lab. I run a, an exhibition of VR works, animated documentaries and virtual reality. And if you end up in Viborg, Denmark, uh, we have an animation festival and a special, um, in, a special exhibition of animated documentaries in VR. OK, so I did this. I t told you about the animation workshop. Then more about the animation workshop. We do a lot of stuff. You should come see and check out our website um, and the Open Workshop Residency, which is where I started. I came as an artist in residence to the Open Workshop many years ago, and I stayed. Um, but the two main things I do now at Tao um, is the AnyDocs program, uh, which is all of these different things, including a, a lab, and I also uh, produce other people's animated documentaries. We have an open call coming up, by the way. Um, and I also work in the research and development department under this practice-based or practice-as research. Um, and I'll be talking a little bit more about this immersive storytelling line that we've taken. Um, but maybe just quickly mention that one of the things that I do as a researcher um, is look into, well, the challenges that we've been having in distribution of XR content. So I'll, soon I'll share some links. You can find our research projects, download the research projects if you're interested, um, and looking at distribution and distribution challenges and channels for XR content. Um, I'd like to go back to the AnyDocs because it's one of the things I'm really most passionate about and really the place where uh, Uri and I started making work that I guess would be considered animated documentaries. Um, I think that you'll, you'll get to see Martina's egg here. Hi, Martina. Thanks for playing with us. Um, but you should take a look at our AnyDocs website where you can see a lot of different things. Well, because my, my talk, yeah, I, I told you I do a lot of different things, right? So I felt it was important to maybe launch with um, something that was a collaborative process, something that was very much about um, um, mixing media, um, and something that still in the realm of sequential linear storytelling. Uh, and as I trace my steps towards uh, interactive multimedia, um, if I don't talk too much about all this other stuff, I'll tell you about the VR game, the multi-user co-location experience that I'm developing now. Um, but first, I'd like to start with telling you about how long, not long. Bec because uh, we were very honored to work with um, film director, documentary filmmaker called Eric Gandini. If you love documentaries, um, you would know him. <laughs> uh, a very prominent Swedish-Italian filmmaker. And, uh, and he was working with the University of Lund University in Sweden, the Stockholm Resilience Center, uh, around the concept of cosmopolitanism. So we had made a 25-minute film, a lot of talking heads, uh, really good talking heads. We had Kofi Annan narrating, um, and all of these different perspectives on what is cosmopolitanism, what makes us a citizen of the world. And um, we were, I think, very, very, he was very generous and let us uh, take the materials that we'd crafted together and the animation that we'd made for his film uh, and edit our own film. So we made a short film called How Long Not Long that's based on um, the, the longer film called Cosmopolitanism, which we collaborated with uh, Eric Andinian. So I'd like to start with showing you this because I think it's kind of fun to 
to see films. Um, I'm going to hope that it works. And you'll have to bear with me while I switch to this. I know you asked him today, how long will it take? Somebody's asking how long will prejudice blind the visions of men? I come to say to you this afternoon, however difficult the moment, yes, sir. however frustrating the hour, it will not be long no, because truth crushed earth will rise again. Yes, How long? Not long. Yes, because no lie can live forever. Yes, How long? Not long. Yes, because you shall reap what you sow.
Yeah, so because the title of my talk was Collaborative Projects, I thought I'd show you that one. Um, but it also, uh, but um, uh, how long, not long is also a project that we, we used in this expanded format, massive projections on buildings. Um, Viborg is also a UNESCO media art city, and we had an opportunity to show works on a large scale uh, to the public with live music, and um, I really got a, a taste for what it's like to work with, well, an audience and with people, and asking a lot of questions about what, who is the audience and who is the, um, the person I make work for. Because I think that in the beginning of my foray into animation, it was really just about wanting to paint the same thing over and over again. Uh, I just wanted to be left al alone to make frame by frame by frame. And then I realized that I had a, a message to share, that I wanted to open up the practice. Um, and then and this is where I guess the topic of my talk sort of shifts towards the transition from the screen-based arts, the sequential linear storytelling, and the more traditional classic animation um, to exploring different modes of spectatorship to looking at virtual reality and what we like to call expanded animation in order to really question the role of audience participation and ultimately um, where the the audience or the um, something wrong Anton you're here because oh I see Um, yeah, so I'm going to maybe tell you a little bit about uh, the journey uh, that we had with uh, Nothing Happens. Am I? I could tell you about Nothing Happens. Nothing happens in this movie. Um, but it did start as a film, um, as an animated film. We're not happy with the internet. Oh, it's just, it's just, you know, it's nice. I get to be put on the spot and you feel more awkward. Um, it's good. I mean, I did come like an hour early to make sure that it worked. Okay, cool, cool. Um, so I'm going to tell you very quickly, oh my gosh, very quickly about Nothing Happens and um, maybe just a just a prelude to Nothing Happens, we'd, we'd experimented with participatory theater before. Um, Nothing Happens was a, was a film, an animated film that we had adapted to VR, but our, our um, first encounter with virtual reality was not actually virtual at all. Um, we had worked with, uh, with a theater company and trying to understand the essence of what is this like, immersive storytelling or, or fragmented um, immersion um, with a project. Maybe if I click it, it'll work. Um, I'm going to show you a little clip. Um, and I'll, I'll talk over it a little bit. So we made a film um, called Hollowland, and um, and Hollowland is a puppet movie, um, and it's it is quite a narrative story about the couple who immigrate and uh, fail. Um, what we did with the Hollowland experience was that we had uh, engaged with a theater company called Cap Lunch. And we'd extracted the characters from the scenography. And we'd projected 360 in a space that was quite big. And we had 30, 40 people come in and put masks on and put on costume. The masks were of characters in the film, but the eye holes were very small. So you had kind of a limited view. Uh, and then we played these games with them. We, we basically had them feel as if they were participating in the animated film um, and feel it in their bodies. Um, and, and I think that for me that was really an eye-opening experience, what we could do with animation.
So yeah, um, uh, in 2017, we released um, Nothing Happens. And like I said, Nothing Happens is, I mean, it's not a, like a traditional film, though it is made uh, hand-painted, frame-by-frame animation. Um, but uh, what, what we decided to do with, there's only three shots in it, um, and they're edited rather abruptly. So it's quite a formalistic film. Um, and I, I don't have time to show you all the films, but this one happens to be online, so you might want to watch it in the dark. Um, the, I think that was interesting for me was especially looking past the um, what happens what happens after film. Where where can I take the theme of nothing happens is spectatorship. It's about witnessing. So what happens when I move the audience from being a passive spectator in the film, which is about passive spectatorship? Um, to a virtual reality space that transports them between the different locations and literally changes their perspective, changes their point of view. Uh, you're watching people watching something that you don't know what it is. And then we put you in the tree. And then we put you in the pit. And every time, your perspective changes, your role as a witness changes as well. So even though um, Nothing Happens was first a film and then an adaptation to VR, we understood what it meant to really play with this medium. Um, and we became very curious about it. The, I'd like to not talk about it too much. Um, but maybe just mention that it was, um, and it was also an installation piece where we used earth projections. We had uh, onboarded our um, now participants, visitors, into the nothing happens space where they stood on, on earth and people were watching them, watching other people being watched. It was kind of uh, actually quite poetic. Um, and that did really well. Um, but I feel like the next step was to look at interactivity. Like, there was some very subtle interactivity and nothing happens. But it was mostly triggered by gaze. You looked at something long enough, it changed. It, the duration of your gaze was the catalyst for the, the, the editing. Um, but the next project that we took on is a project called Songbird. Uh, we were approached by the Guardian newspaper, the Garden VR, they used to have a VR department. Um, they were making a project about uh, an extinct bird. It was actually about sonic fossils. Um, and uh, they had sent, they were making a project that was to be sent on the Google Cardboard to 200,000 of their subscribers. Um, what we did with, um, with Songbird eventually was turn it into a, uh, an interactive piece. Maybe if I press that, you'll see it. Far, far away, in the middle of the vast blue ocean, where rolling waves sweetly rose and fell, a distant island lay. An enchanted place of deep canyons, lush forests, and birds, magnificent, graceful birds, birds of all kinds. And to this glorious land, the scientist, Mr. Jim Jacoby, traveled. Even if I go back 50 times, all of it is really exciting. It's a pretty spectacular place to be, let me tell you. again. Um, so I'm just going to very quickly run through these slides because um, I thought it would be interesting to talk about process, how we worked with journalists and how we worked with scientists and how we worked with researchers who are also very um, 
very keen on accuracy. Uh, we worked very, very closely with biologists, ornithologists to create these, I'd say, almost realistic depictions of the island of Kauai. Um, I didn't actually get to go, which was too bad, but I got to paint a lot of forest and a lot of trees and a lot of bushes. It was fun. Um, and it was also really challenging to take the paintings that I had made and map them to fit an environment that you could walk around in. Um, and we weren't pretending that they weren't paintings. We weren't pretending that they weren't flat. But we needed to create an environment that was rich enough uh, and believable enough for you to get lost in, in the jungle. Um, there were also quite a lot of work with birds and a, a little bit of AI. Um, where would the birds be landing? And how do we program that, that you're always, wherever you look, a bird will come? And there was, it was kind of fun and very techy. Um, there's also a device where you can record the OO bird. It's a very sad story about the bird that came and to the recording, but it turns out that's the last one. Anyway, um, we created an educational package around this. The Songbird is actually still touring libraries, a lot of libraries around Denmark and different places in France and Europe, um, uh, schools. So it's an installation, it's kind of a self-contained installation. Um, and we worked with pedagogues and with um, librarians to kind of create a, an environment that people could learn something about our age of extinction. Um, so Songbird was a lot of fun, but we wanted to move back to tell. Uh, the, the next project I'll tell you about is called um, The Hangman at Home. So Songbird started out as a VR piece. Uh, we decided, when I did some more financing, uh, to turn it into an interactive VR piece. Um, and f nothing happened, started as a film, and then it was adapted to VR. In The Hangman, we made a multimedia piece from the onset. We decided to see if we could uh, make a piece of work that not only was created in a different mediums, but also reflected on those different mediums. That our choice of medium didn't define the story, but it did define your, your interpretation of it. Um, and we worked on these simultaneously, these different outputs. We like to call them rather than versions, uh, because they aren't versions. We've made it, we made a film. The Hangman at Home is a, is a film. And it's also a single user VR experience. Additionally, it's a multi-user, co-location, interactive piece, uh, installation, and a performance. But all of these things were, were generated, conceptualized at the same time, though they're very different from each other. Um, maybe, I'll, maybe I can tell you a little, tell you a little bit about it. Um, Oh, I just mentioned the production is a National Film Board of Canada production. And um, we had two co-producers in France, both uh, Miu Productions and Floreal Films. Um, our Danish producer, who I'm extremely thankful for, um, is Lana from a production company called Late Love Productions. Um, and actually, it's thanks to her that we managed to make such a complex multimedia project and she's still she's touring with this thing and cursing a little bit. But um, I think that it's been a wonderful journey in, in understanding what it is um, that VR can do for us. Wait, I'm not going to show this actually. I'll show something else. Um, I'll just note, because I think that this is maybe important, the starting point for The Hangman at Home is a poem called The Hangman at Home uh, by a, a, an icon in um, American po literature and poetry. His name is Carl Sandburg. Um, and the poem, The Hangman at Home, appears in a collection of works called Smoke and Steel. So this poem is you know, 100 years old, but it's really relevant and it was really meaningful that we could approach it when we did in the way that we did. Um, am I going to show you? 
I'm going to show you the VR. Maybe I will. Does that play? What does the hangman think about when he goes home at night from work? Also some of the, oh, I have to hold this closer to my face. Um, this is some of the early early artwork for the Hangman at Home. Um, I'm just gonna sort of zip through the process because it, it was so fun to make. Um, it was all hand painted, but the the I think the, maybe the most challenging part was to direct a VR interactive kind of create your own adventure at the same time as making a film that, again, had a very uh, structured, very almost dogmatic editing. And we really uh, embraced the cinematic tools that we have at our disposal. Um, whereas in VR, you get to walk through rooms. You get to choose which rooms you'll be in and what happens in the way that the story unfolds. Um, maybe there's also a little bit about how we made it. I lose a lot of painting. I don't think I'll ever make another film on paper like this. It's really not ecological. Um, but it was a lot of fun to shoot it and paint it. Um, this is some of the kind of co the color scheme and, and the different characters that appear in them. Um, we played, we did a lot of sketching um, when we played with puppets because I, I'd mentioned that our previous films, we'd also used puppets and, and that was something we wanted to go back to. Um, we used a little bit of photogrammetry, tested all kinds of different techniques, what would work for us, because we needed to make the interactive elements uh, 3D. How do, you, how do you move one, st the, the style that's very much handmade, very painterly, or drawn into a 3D universe was, uh, was quite challenging. And um, we wanted to keep something very tactile and very much in our fingerprint. Um, and since we'd also designed it as an installation to begin with, we thought a lot about like spaces and how you would move around spaces. Um, and we we were looking at you know different different uh, participatory traditions and participatory art um, and how we could learn from that. Um, is that the multi-user? Okay, so it, yeah, we had a lot of we had a lot of fun with uh, designing the the performance and the installation, and, and we feel that bringing people into the room and the way that you give them guidance and instructions on how to use the the technology could disarm them and make them feel comfortable in a space, which I think is a key. We also feel that this offboarding is another very important part of what we do. It's all theater, basically. Um, so we engage with people who come from the performing arts when we onboard and offboard people from our VR experiences um, and design installation spaces with projections and reactive projections. We use different kinds of sensors in the room so that it's also interesting to watch from the outside. Even if you're not in VR, there's still the story unfolds. Um, so yeah, so uh, the, the thing that happened between the, the VR single user, which is a very solitary experience, it was, the hangman at home, it's, the hangman at home is not about hanging people. Um, it's really more about like your role 
um, as a participant, whether it's in your own life or whether it's um, in the very domestic moments that you choose to engage or disengage. Um, so creating it, or crafting it for a, for a group required a very different kind of approach to the topic. Um, and in the Hangman at Home single user, uh, you get to choose your own pathway and open that door and see that. You don't get to see all the rooms. You have to crawl through fireplace and things. Um, but in the multi-user, um, it's different because you have common actions. You have to work together or do something together as a group in order to um, kind of move, move on from one episode to another. And there's interactive uh, elements that really bring you together as, as a group. So we're sort of looking at your responsibility as an individual, but then also how does that change when you're um, in a group of people sharing something? Um, do, do I have time to show the hangman at home? It's 12 minutes. When, how, how, when was the... I think the start was at 11.55, so basically... So I have a couple of minutes, 12. So 35 is basically the end of the post movie. Oh, right. Okay, so... I'm not sure I get to show you the hangman at home, which is too bad. Um, but maybe I'll tell you just something about um, the next project I'm doing. I thought you would have liked it. So, yeah, yeah, but that's why I asked. Otherwise, I would have just plowed ahead. Um, learning from our experiences, or moving, moving from the, moving from audience as spectators to audience as participants, and then, and then to users and players. Um, was a kind of a natural progression. So I was also telling you earlier about the research project that I was engaged um, to do about distribution of XR. And I think that I've learned really a lot from distributing uh, The Hangman at Home and We Are at Home. So the, the project that we're working on now, well, we're also doing a short film, I'm also proposing a PhD, and I'm developing a feature. But this, Garden Alchemy, um, is a game. It started out as a, um, I guess I'm gonna talk about it after all. I, I, it's really fresh, it's really new. We've just made a prototype. It's so ugly, I can't show it to you. Um, but we did a concert. We did a series of concerts. Because Garden Alchemy is, it's, it's based on this idea of bioregionalism or what connects you to the place where you are. And I just wanted to make, I wanted to get to know my garden better. I wanted to feel more connected to my neighborhood. This feeling of displacement is just so unhealthy. How do I um, create the sense of community around you know, the artwork that we make? Um, and I'm very curious about eco prints and textiles, and I love to work in the print workshop. Where so most of the work that I've done for Garden Alchemy is is dry point and um, etching, non toxic etchings. Um, so in a way, it's kind of a frame for me to experiment with very traditional uh, fine art techniques. But also, it's about listening and creating a space for live music. So we wanted to do a show that's, uh, that's live music and um, handmade animation. And we play live. It's like I basically do a VJ. Um, but it's grown together with the musicians and with the music. So Garden Alchemy is a concert, audiovisual show. Um, and then we've done kind of an adaptation to a VR space. Um, and then we thought, OK, so if Garden Alchemy, or the, this changing seasons of the year, is a visual and tactile framework for, um, for the concert, well, what are we doing in, a, in this VR space? And the, the space that we have to work in is about 10 meters by 12. We've got sensors in the floor. We can put in 
15, 20 people in VR sets um, where the anti-latency is great, calibration's great, it really works. So what now? So we're making a game. We're making, we're making a game where you can play and you have to kind of create this equilibrium. Uh, you're the weather, you get to be a rain cloud or a sun and you get to have these different weather events. Um, and we've noticed with our prototype that um, it's really fun to play the game. And uh, the visuals and the audio support that. So that w I think we managed to create a very poetic experience that's also very playful. One of the things that we learned from The Hangman is that narrative in VR, yeah, I don't know. It's like uh, there's so much... Con there's so much control exercised when I make an animation film, and I have to completely relinquish that when I'm working in virtual reality, and especially when I'm working with a multi, like people. People are like, yeah, unpredictable. They do this emergent behavior thing. It's really funny, but we have to create like a setting that will um, support that. So and we were still very early um, in our research, and we're looking for people who'd be interested in working with us and developing it further. Um, yeah, here's some images of that concert. Oh, and there is a picture of the very ugly prototype. It works, by the way. Prototype works. Um, and it's fun to make. But, yeah. Um, thank you very much for um, your attention. Does that work? Yes. So thanks a lot. I don't know if we have Maybe. time for questions. Sorry? I don't know if we have time for questions, but let's, I just wanted try. to let you know that I'd be around, and I'm very happy to, to talk to anybody about any of the many different things that cool. I've mentioned. So maybe we can make the setup change and during that time a few questions if there's yeah. the chance. I'm going to move out of the way so Martina can do her thing. So here's one question. Yeah. Um, what you're doing, super exciting, I, I love it. I, I'm curious about physicality. Yeah. So the experience that happens through the corporeal senses yeah. as we position our bodies, feel ourselves through our senses and our gestures. And the challenge of having a VR headset, being multi-user within a, a shared space, these things that we're familiar with in terms of the challenges that that can bring or, or becoming familiar with you know, dizziness, fear of walking into things, tripping on things, bumping into each other. Um, what is this like? How are you approaching this? What are you considering including? Are you starting to look at the use of HoloLens to work with mixed reality? Uh, I think mixed reality is really a, a way forward. Um, I'm very pleased to report that I'm much more comfortable in the newer VR headset. I'm very comfortable with this kind of the calibration so I can really see where people really are. Um, and I work in a very large space so that it allows kind of an, an ease. Um, but we, you know, we do very much consider what we do like a tactile digital. So we work with scent and we work with touch. Uh, and we work with different reactive textiles and materials. The other thing that we've been playing with now is attaching sensors to objects. So your objects are placed in places where you, they, you could move them around. Um, you could take the sun or move a plant. There's all kinds of interesting. The tactility is a key, I think, when we're looking at sort of this kind of digital um, games. And I'm very curious to work with people, mostly in the performing arts, who sort of know, I mean, they've been doing this for, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm just really curious about inviting different practices to inform, um, the, especially the tactility and embodiment. Um, I have a question here. Um, First, I really like the project. Uh, I think it will be an amazing experience to explore that space in VR. And my question is, uh, you said the, your newest project will be a game. Will it be uh, about exploring a space? 
And do you think you could uh, will lay, add a layer, a layer to the game with, for example, gloves? Like many open source projects suggest how to make picking up objects really feel like you're holding them in your hand. Do you think that will be something you will explore? Well, we, uh, I've, I've tried working with sensors on a, like a, a little wristband with a sensor, which I think is important because one of the biggest problems is kind of this fidelity or this, uh, you know, yeah, the track, the hand tracking, it's, it's a thing because I really hate controllers. So we've given up on the controllers, but there's a, it's not perfect. Um, but we're definitely working with different kinds of sensors in order to find that next level. So I'm open to it. But they're very expensive, the sensors. So if I want to make a big show for a lot of people, yeah, it's a consideration. This one? Anyway, I would say... Mine works. Uh, I, no, it works again. Um, thanks. I would say thanks a lot, Michelle. Thank you. I'm very happy that you get to introduce my friend, Martina. I'm going to hand this over, Grace. Thank you. <laughs> Do you want... To yeah, the funny thing is, uh, yeah, originally when we when we thought about inviting Martina, we thought she's the in this Asifa context the um, the more traditional part. And after the first meeting, we learned <laughs> that she no. quite changed in the last years, where she's also based in Denmark. So Martina is from Italy originally, and. Yes, so I will hand over to her and her talk. I just wanted to draw. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, yeah, I think now I have to step up my game after Michelle and uh, Creek presentation. But um, I have, um, yeah, I have a background uh, as a fine artist uh, and. My whole life, I just wanted to draw. And then the past uh, seven years since I moved to Denmark, I ended up engaging in all sorts of other activities that involve drawing, uh, such as animation. And uh, now I'm also producing films as a producer. Uh, I'm a creative director of a virtual theater that uses VR and uh, motion capture and do real-time performances. Um, and so I do all sorts of things. So this uh, talk will mostly go through uh, a little bit of a journey through a selection of my work um, where I'm trying to highlight uh, what are the things that have always been there from the beginning and how technology sort of sneaked into my practice a little by little. Um, so yeah, I, as I mentioned, I work at Whitehall Theatre, which is a virtual theatre in Viborg. Uh, I own a company called Martina Scarpelli Studio where I used to make my own films and uh, produce themes of other people when sometimes you stumble on a project that you can't help but be part of. And so I help other directors make the films. Uh, I also have a, 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 an art collective of um, um, great professionals working together called Plastic Collective, also in Viborg. And as Michelle, uh, I'm also part of the Animation Workshop uh, Research and Development Department and Open Workshop Residency, which is a great place to be. Uh, if you're doing animation. Um, this is my most of, you know, a kind of like a recap of my work, um, uh, which I'm going to talk about. Uh, my graduation film, Cosmetico Egg, uh, my first professional film made in the context of also of Anidocs, where I met Michelle. And this is a feature film I'm working on now, which is uh, an animated opera. Um, I don't do only my own work. Uh, I also work for hire quite a lot lately, uh, directing music videos, or um, lately I've been also uh, working as a designer for games, uh, which is something new, and I learn it's something I actually like to do. Um, using, uh, I kind of don't mind changing style and trying different things. Um, this is an app in collaboration with uh, uh, a psychiatrist to use as a supplementary tool for treatment of eating disorders. Uh, illustration for books and whatnot I 
really uh, mix it all. Um, but always with the focus on uh, basically uh, drawing. Um, I'm classical trained. Uh, I studied in the Arts Academy in Milan in Brera, uh, mostly painting and etching. Uh, that's my biggest love. And uh, I also, you know, bread and butter during the studies, I was uh, working as a graphic designer for like snowboard company. Um, and, uh, and some of my teachers noticed that I had this like passion for like uh, creating these universes, these worlds. And um, one day one of my teachers asked me, why don't you try to do the same thing you're doing while you're drawing, but uh, with a camera instead of a pencil. And I was a bit surprised, but um, I took it very literally and uh, I started making these little storyboards and like trying to look at my process uh, inward and um, take notes. And so I would go around and take little videos and then edit them, learning after effect of what, what, what was at the time. Um, and I started making these little experiments, uh, moving experiments. I'm, I'm not going to play it, but um, results were not great, but uh, I learned a lot about um, directing an audience, um, um, guiding the audience experience and uh, rhythm and editing and basically storytelling. Um, no, don't play. Yes. Uh, another, another big, uh, big passion of mine is uh, iconography. Uh, in Italy, frescoes are everywhere, so you kind of grow with it. Um, and I've always been fascinated about um, um, what the symbol is behind this. I mean, it's allegorical allegor alleg allegories, so you kind of have to study a little bit uh, behind it and learn how to read it. Um, so I, I got really passionate about all these figures, and these are some of my favorite from Siena in the 300. Um, Lucky enough, in Brera Art Academy, uh, who was, by the way, built by uh, Nostra Empress, uh, Maria Cristina, I think. Um, she thought that uh, to make good art, you have to be inspired by literature, so there is a library, and science, so there is a, an observatorium on the roof, and um, nature, so there is a botanical garden in the academy. Um, and so I had, the I had access to all this uh, knowledge and, and books, and I found uh, um, some uh, iconograph iconography manuals that um, I really liked, and so I ended up writing a thesis about... Uh, vices and virtues iconography in, uh, in art history. Uh, and I mentioned this because it's going to make sense later. Uh, and then that year in Milan happened to be a William Kentridge exhibition, which uh, I visited. And um, that was the last uh, link. And I said, OK, I, wanna, I really would like to invest uh, in uh, moving images and animation. And so a week later, I was applying for animation school. Um, my graduation film is called Cosmoetico. Um, it's, uh, um, it was inspired by um, mathematics, something I read during uh, uh, some theory study at the, at the Art Academy. Um, it was a collection of attempts to define nothing in a very mathematical way, which non, non, I mean, I, I couldn't understand all of it, of course. But one of it was very simple. And it was, uh, if you can imagine the whole world as a balloon um, full of things, and so nothing is that balloon with the radius equal to zero. And so um, I imagine this, this girl who is trying to find out what is the smallest part of the universe, and uh, she imagines she can empty the world uh, to find out what's the smallest part. And then in doing that process, she realized that she's also part of it. And so she will not find the answers. Um, uh, I definitely developed uh, a lot of uh, my style through this film. Um, a little, a little, at least we say moving style. Uh, I'll play a little clip so you get an idea. Is this? this
So um, during um, right after school, I decided that uh, yeah, directing film was something I like to do, uh, and so I I started to develop a new project called Egg. Uh, it started as a school uh, little workshop. Um, it's a it's a two D film. It ended up being a two D slash 3D animated film. It's 12 minutes and uh, it's going to be screened tonight at the uh, Deep Space as well. Um, it's based on a personal story about me um, um, uh, dealing with uh, recovering from an eating disorder. And, uh, but it's also not just about that. It's really very much about uh, a story about failure. Uh, there is a woman at home. She's stuck at home with an egg, and she's very afraid of it. She doesn't want to eat it, but then she eats it, and she regrets it. So um, that's the story in short. Um, the, as I said, the story was developed um, first as a... Um, um, I, I made the first um, animatic of the film at school in a, like three days. The whole idea came from one of this uh, iconography that I found out in the art academy, that's uh, gluttony. Um, the ancient Greek believed that uh, food pleasure comes by the touch uh, and not by taste, because it's driven by the contact between food and throat walls. So the longer the neck, the longer the pleasure. And so <laughs> I basically took this iconography and, uh, and tailored my own story to it. Um, so the film um, is uh, different than the original idea, um, uh, the original animatic that I made in that week. Uh, but some of the ideas of the film um, were actually already there. Uh, so the film is mostly square. There is a, like a, a lot of it is developed vertically. There is a sense of claustrophobia. The house is a cube. And all these things were basically just uh, drafted from the first moment. Um, the film originally was really, um, really uh, dark and, and uh, very rough. The, the drawing sketches were really rough. So in the two years and a half of development process from the, the, first, time, the first draft of the animatic to the actual filmmaking, um, I cleaned the film in all possible way. Um, the style became much more polished. Uh, I also learned what it, what it is that I wanted to have from the film, in, both as a director and as an audience experience. Um, I, I started to understand how to direct an audience experience through style and voice and all this. Um, so I always felt when I first screened the first draft of the animatic uh, to people, um, I always felt a little bit shy and a little bit uh, not proud of it. And that, that's definitely not the, feel, the, the feeling you want to have. You, you, know, you want to stand behind your film. Um, so I also felt that the rough lines wasn't really the, um, uh, expressing what uh, the feeling of, or, um, not anorexia only, but just like that moment didn't felt that dark or that, uh, that rough. It felt more sharp and pointy and poisonous, so I felt that the style had to reflect that. Uh, I did the same on the character from the original sketches that, you know, coming from the etching, you, are, you want everything to feel a bit uh, uh, grainy and rough and, and dirty, but then instead I wanted everything to be more sharp and polished. Um, I did all the, a lot of experiments. Again, uh, I was obsessed with glitches and colors, but ended up going for classical, elegant black and white. Um, Again, I experiment with text. There is this like Zygo generator that makes glitchy text, and I tried all sorts of things, but uh, I ended up not using it. I like to find out what it is that um, that work uh, in function of the film. It's, I, I always think, you know, we, we are. Vi I'm, I'm a visual person. I get attracted to things that look good, but sometimes they just look good on Instagram and not on a film. Like, uh, I don't know, like, I love this, but it didn't really work. This is like, we did some camera mapping um, uh, to try with the style. But, um, and that's all because you are, because I was in this animation workshop residency, open workshop, and you are surrounded by people who try things and they are, they are so skilled. And so, you know, you, you get a beer and you can try to do these things in two hours in an evening because everybody lives there. And it's, uh, it's really inspiring. Anyway, ended up to be 2D flat. And uh, these are some of the final sketches uh, of the film. Uh, so the, out, the environment outside the, the body of the woman, 
the protagonist of the film, it's very polished, very sharp, very pointy, geometric, and instead the environment inside the body is very deep and layered and a little bit more tactile and, and sensual. Um, yeah, this is my animation style. I do very rough, rough, and then I do most of the work in cleanup and line work. Um, I have a part of the film that was made by um, my dear friend Lars Hemmingsen, a CG artist who made the uh, cube. Uh, we designed it together and then I did some animation and he uh, rendered the cube and then compositing. It's really simple. Uh, there was one long, big shot that was really hard to make, and I never planned the layout that was this this complicated. And I mean, it looks simple, but it was really not easy. I have a little make-off for the animators, maybe, in the room. I ended up animating everything in TV paint because... Uh, uh, I couldn't get the organic feeling I wanted to get from uh, overlaying loops in After Effects. It didn't feel right. Um, and then some of the scenes where I always really wanted the egg to be on focus. I didn't want to cheat by putting things on top of it to kind of have a cut. Um, so it was uh, really painful, but it paid off. Yeah. I, I had a click. <laughs> anyway, success story. We, have, we are really happy to release the film in Annecy. And that's Lana, my producer, and Michelle's producer. She's a great like, late love production. Uh, she likes to take on projects that are really hard to make normally. So, <laughs> um, yeah. And um, after Egg was done, uh, because you, I live in Viborg and because Viborg is the land of, uh, why don't you try to do this thing? Uh, I was asked to, do, to try to adapt Egg into a VR experience. And so I've, I'm a VR skeptic, skepticist. I'm skeptic. I don't know the medium. I always felt uh, I didn't feel um, engaged. And uh, I don't know, I think it's hard enough to make a film and try to you know, answer the question, how do you want the audience to feel? And I feel like in VR, you have to get to the question, how do you want the audience to behave? And I don't know, it, it was really, um, uh, really hard for me. But we did a test. We made this like boob cave where the egg was falling while you hear a piece of the, a piece of the um, narration of the film. Uh, it looked great, uh, but... Um, oh, but I also felt that uh, there was there was really nothing in there. You know, I I feel sometimes it's not enough that you're just in a beautiful space. Um, you you really need to have either a role or there has to be something more. It's just not, you know, after ten minutes you're in a beautiful space. What what's there for you? Um, so I felt a little bit um, that VR was not for me. So I decided to go back to 2D and I started developing uh, Psychomachia, which is uh, a feature animated opera. And uh, staging all these little uh, vices and virtues characters that I encountered in my past um, uh, in the Art Academy. So, yeah, those are some of the characters. There is greed, there is uh, gluttony, there is rage, there is justice, beauty, and so on. And back then, I started to do research on how to, you know, what are these characters today and how do they... Um, what could they be in us? And uh, there is this little poem, um, it's not a little poem, it's a long poem uh, from, a, from a, um, a Roman poet called Prudencio, you know, very old. Uh, he's a Christian monk and he's like uh, contemplating God and he's having a hard time because he doesn't know where is God. And so he's describing this like human struggle of finding answer as this uh, inner inner fight between the army of the devil and the army of the god. And so the army of the devil are obviously the, f the vices and the army of the god is the um, virtues. And of course, virtues wins, the vices are destroyed, bleeding, and is all bad for them. And so I'm not readapting the poem, but I thought that I like the idea of this like inner epic of uh, these um, epic characters. Um, and uh, describing life as this like giant opera within ourselves. So that's, um, I started developing, f starting again from the characters. Um, and so what I normally do is that I take the, um, the book and I start research uh, on iconography. I have different sources. And, uh, and then I try to find either symbols or 
uh, things in what I read that inspire storytelling on, or narratives for the characters. Uh, so this is Beauty, for example. She is normally a woman with a head among the above the cloud that is visible only to um, God and God goddesses. Um, and then, okay, I try play with tools, play with 3D, whatever you know, whatever I think is fun. Um, but I always end up back in drawing and sketching. And so this narrative ended up being the story of uh, a mother with a very long body and the head above the cloud, so she can't talk to the daughter that lives in the floor, so they can only connect through voice. And of course, voice is uh, important in an opera. So. Um, that's our work. This is very early development. Um, I, I don't have a full uh, pitch, but just to give you a little bit of the ideas. This is Rage and Time. Rage has a bear helmet. She spits fire. And uh, this is the character of uh, the current pitch. Um, might not make it to the final script, though, so I don't know. And these are Hope and Fate. And you know, hope and faith are such old, uh, in, a, in the past they were represented in a certain way, and today I could not link them in a way. Uh, so I really try to um, put everything into the context of today. Uh, sometimes I develop, I take some symbolism and I try to make drawings that help me finding out what the narratives are, what the stories are or could be, um, and then end up creating characters through instead more traditional drawing. Uh, so I go all sorts of ways actually. And then sometimes I use the characters um, in other contexts, like these are album covers for some musicians, and is, I like to do that because I, I end up testing the character and see what the character can or can't do, or can or cannot communicate, and also help me developing the style for the film. Um, and I like this a lot, but I also feel like it's very, uh, in a, despite the color, I feel the line is very dramatic, and, and I don't think it will take a lot of attention from the film, so I ended up with this as the final idea for the look of the opera which is a little bit of both the sketches and the, and the digital. Now, sidetracking. During the um, development of this uh, script, uh, this is one of the characters of the script is MV. And uh, in Psychomachia, the opera, some, sometimes the character is a piece of the environment. There is a character with a lake, and MV is uh, 21 statues. And they are, it's a field where everybody has to pass through and all sorts of things happen. Um, they are like a, a group of step siblings that they don't like each other and they're stuck in this, in, this, uh, in this field. But at least they are not alone. And um, so because the film, the feature film, the opera format, because all of this is so hard to produce and so hard to pitch, um, Lana and I, Lana uh, Lidloff and I, and uh, decided that it was a good idea to make um, not really a prototype um, or a proof of concept, but just like use some of this um, character to make a short, a short version of the opera, even if it's not in the same style or in exactly the same format, uh, just to learn how do you adapt uh, a script into a libretto, how do you make, uh, uh, how do you work with the composer, how do you work with the orchestra for the, or the singers, how do you make live dubbing on, on the concert. And so I started developing a short animated opera called uh, Songs of MB, and it's about 11 uh, dying statues that reflect upon the misery of life. Um, and I'd need to also go on a detour. Um, in the meantime, between um, when I started developing Psychomachia and fin after finishing Egg, I, op I, I started this uh, art collective with a group of uh, friends uh, and extremely professional people. And uh, those happen to be a lot of uh, coders, programmers, game developers, writers, and uh, producers and really good directors as well. So this is the environment I'm in uh, every day. Uh, and so all of a sudden, technology started to be less uh, scary. VR, it's like a thing that everybody does in the house, and um, mapping, projection, AI, um, so video games especially as well. So um, I don't know, it just became, it became more friendly, it became more of a thing that I can like when I was back in the residency, something that is just there, you can try. Is not that uh, is not that hard. At the same time, I started working as the creative director for um, a virtual theater, Whitehall Theater, uh, where we do this um, these real time performances in Viborg. 
So the way it works is that we have actors in motion capture suits uh, performing a story um, that happened 900 years ago in the city that we are. So we are staging the show in the same square where the play took place 900 years ago. So it's based on Saxo uh, narrative, um, uh, Danish history, basically. And so my role on the, all this is trying to develop a style that is uh, um, kind of uh, forgiving and uh, because, of course, the tech never really works all the time correctly, so you want the body to look uh, beautiful no matter what happened with the tracking and um, and also just trying to use animation tools of storytelling that doesn't rely on just the the exact reproduction of what's happened you know of the of the realistic body movement um, yeah there is a little test processing yeah we're using extend suit here And yeah, the audience will be wearing a VR headset, um, Oculus Quest 2, part of the audience. And then the, a lot of the audience will instead yes, seeing. Oops, Lars talking. Um, uh, the rest of the audience will see what happened in the meta stage uh, on a screen. Um, yeah, that's also. That's what I meant when I meant what I said, like uh, we're trying to use animation for what animation is good for, so play with proportions and just really using the language and the medium. Uh, I can show you a little bit of the summer show. You got the idea. Um, I, yes, everything happens outdoor, which is really a challenge. So next year, we're going to move indoor. Decided. Uh, we also try to we collaborate with historians and museums because uh, we really care about being it um, correct as much as we can know from the past. Um, so we have all these assets from the past history of Denmark that we end up then reused to create uh, VR experiences for museums. And um, yeah, we collaborate with museum in, in, in create, creating more outputs for what we, what we are doing. Um, also, talking about I didn't want to do VR, um, I was uh, all of a sudden uh, asked to make a music video for uh, a jazz concert in, uh, in virtual reality with the Aorus Jazz Orchestra, uh, thanks also to the Animation Workshop uh, Research and Development Department. And so we were asked to make this like 30-minute uh, concert where um, the audience would be partly in virtual reality and partly not. And so we developed a, um, an, an experience where the audience would be seated at the center of the orchestra. There would be a curtain all around them, and the musician would be outside the curtain. So when the audience would enter, the um, musician would, would not be visible. So the concert would play. Yeah, that was, was happening outside the curtain. <laughs> and <laughs> Uh, so the first part of the concert was like a, a virtual reality experience. So you just hear the music and you see some visuals in virtual reality. Then you were asked to take the headset off and you see um, backlit musicians through the curtain. Then there is a second part of the concert where you're actually in virtual reality again. And then the second time you take your headset off, you are the curtains are out and it's very surprisingly and uh, the music is just next to you. So it kind of feels a bit... I mean, empowered music is a bad term, but like it's very powerful experience. And I, I felt there was something in there that was worth uh, exploring more. Um, these were some of the, yeah, it's, it's uh, 
like color a bit different, but um, it was mostly a, an idea to be a tribute of Oscar Fischinger optical poems and original animation experimentations and so on in an immersive environment. Um, and uh, yeah, these are some pictures of the of the of the event. Um, so after all this um, experience with virtual reality and. Uh, uh, I really wanted to try more of, of this uh, with music, so ended up transforming the Songs of Envy in a VR animated opera, because it wasn't easy enough. Um, so, um, yeah, to explain what's going to happen, I'm in, as the, we are in development now, so we are trying to build the project. We have a little bit of funding, so we started working on the setup. So on stage, there will be audience seating on chairs with VR headset, and then there will be singers. Uh, instead of an orchestra, this will be a choir. So there will be singers, uh, live singers, and then matched on the meta stage by statues. So the audience will, uh, will only see the the statues in the meta world and hear the singer's voice. Uh, and in the meta world, you see the, this is a mock-up, of course. Uh, there is this group of statues living life stuck in the field and mocked by a group of birds. Uh, and then at some point, the weather changes and the birds fly away and they're really unhappy. The, the statues are uh, really complaining about life, is always worrying about um, other people's happiness and other sisters' happiness and what, what is she doing to be happy? Why is she happier than me? Or should I be happier? And, um, but then all of a sudden, the, a golden rain starts falling and the statues become coated with gold. And they're really happy because finally they're shining and they find the, there was like the, the climax of life. They're finally together, all golden and shining and happy. But then they realize that the, the bottom of the field turns into a muddy field and they start sinking. So even when you thought you were happy, then life turns back and uh, reveals to be kind of a mockery. And so, while the statues are sinking, we ask the audience to take off the headset, and they find themselves in this like dark stage, and uh, and the singers are revealed by, by, one by one through lighting. Uh, the way we have imagined the singing is very much singing at each other and not together as a group, so it's mostly like sung through narration and uh, dialogue based at this point. And so you will see and hear part of the performance live. Um, uh, by seeing the singers. And then we ask the audience to go back on the meta stage. And there, at that point, the statues are, the rain has stopped and the statues are completely at the bottom of the, of the ground with only the head out. Um, but then at that point, the sun comes back and shines and then for a moment, they are actually truly happy uh, and they realize that they can be together. <laughs> uh, and then they start singing for the first time together as a group and not alone. At that point, we are out, and then you actually hear the whole, uh, the whole choir together singing as a group, which I hope will be as powerful as the experience we had with the orchestra. So the stage we are at now is uh, that we are trying to work with prototype and unity and um, with some of the colleagues at the Art Collective. This is just a very early development. I'm not super happy about it because I like, I think it's very ironic, but I really miss a little bit of the, Oh, no, I didn't know there was a move. Yeah, I missed a bit of the epicness and the, the classical um, mythology behind it uh, that I think elevates the, or like kind of like connects you to something more um, um, ideal of some sort. Uh, uh, and I missed that in the mock-up. I'm done. If you have any question. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, yes, here's a question. Paul? Hello? Yeah, this was it. Um, I have a question, and that also is a little bit for almost for the previous talk as well, and maybe even for some talks from yesterday. But I feel like in general with VR being a fairly new technology, having hardware requirements, software requirements, uh, computational requirements, of course, that we're trying to overcome and hopefully get better with, um, all of your seem to come from a very traditional background. You mentioned drawing a lot in the previous talk. It was a lot of painting, a lot of real 
real life art tools being used to create the art and then project it in a VR space. Um, do you feel the VR space being a little bit limiting in maybe a positive way, maybe in a, a negative way? You mentioned a mock-up. It maybe doesn't capture quality yet. Is What are the things that you're missing creatively when you transform your work, for example, into a VR space, if anything? Or is the added immersion enough? You know? Yeah. Maybe you want to answer to Misha, but I think, I mean, I definitely miss the style quality a lot. Like I, most of my films are, um, I take fun and pride into developing a, a look and a visual that I don't think is reflected in the VR in the same way. Uh, that's the biggest, uh, the biggest um, concern I have when developing VR. The thing is that it's not, you can't translate it one by one. So uh, what it is that gives you the same um, effect for the audience in VR and finding that I think is still like for me that I'm new to the medium is still a question every time. Um, and so I, I, I got to trust uh, the people I work with that they know better and so come with the solutions that is as interesting and gives the same, I mean, gives to the audience the experience that I want them to have. Um, and then the other thing I think is different is very much, for me at least, uh, as a director of an, a VR experience, I really try to, I kind of design the, I script the audience journey in, in a way. So there is an extra character in the, in the film or play or whatever that be. Uh, which I don't have the same when I do a film, and is, that's an added problem if you want to. And um, and we had a nice conversation yesterday about it with Michelle because it's true when you have when you're making a film, you have a cinematic toolkit. Uh, so you have the sound, the colors, the style, and the editing that drives the audience to feel a certain things. With the VR, you are really you you can't direct people um, and so there is a certain time there is a uh, control that you have to let go and so how do you where is the balance i think that's the challenge big yeah so another question yes here um i i wanted to ask a question about your comfort as an artist looking at your sketchbooks, these absolutely fabulous, um, wild and Im impulsive and imperative kinds of drawings and explorations. What is it like for you creatively to dedicate yourself to this kind of very technical process? Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I, I, um, I'm also, I also really enjoy the tech. Uh, like ner nerdying uh, in it, I don't mind it. Um, I think that I, I like both. I don't know. Uh, I think when I do a sketchbook, it's more of like my sketchbook is more a tool for research, and uh, I don't find it that they are finished piece necessarily. Sometimes they are, or like if it's a series of drawing, that would be something. Uh, but I, I, what I like, what gives me the motivation is make something, make things, whether that's a, uh, a project. Like at the beginning, it was just a series of drawing, right? Then, then it becomes a film, then it becomes a VR opera, then it, what's going to come next, I don't know. But I think the, the process of it, like putting together pieces and formalizing and deciding what that's going to be, I think that's what, it's always the same for me. It doesn't matter whether it's a te it involves tech or it's only a pure paper experience. So, anyone? So maybe one question from my side as a last one, maybe. Um, Egg was shown at so many festivals, 150 yeah. or something, and winning 45 awards, I read. Yeah. Are you concerned when you create now this, well, quite complicated things that it's not so easy to show them at festivals because of, of course, always, you know, one topic of festivals is always budgets and, mm. you know, like it's a question to, yes, also maybe Michelle. And uh, yes, uh, what's your point on that? I mean, I'm, I'm really glad how everything went with Egg. I can't deny that was a, it was surprising and beautiful. Um, but no, I think uh, 
Yeah, I mean, just after finishing egg, you know, everything you think about is like, oh my God, I have to have a make, to make a better film. So you feel the pressure. But I don't know, I feel like I'm gratified with my work so much that I, I don't care mm. whether it's going to make uh, uh, 46 awards, one more than egg. I don't know. It doesn't, I, I don't think about it, actually. That's good. I hope, I hope uh, uh, what I really hope is that uh, my work will be seen and uh, connect to other people through it. That's, uh, that's, the, that's the only thing that's mm. important for me, at least. And maybe I didn't get it totally. Uh, psych Psychomachia, mm -hmm. it's a 90-minute thing. Is it, a, is it a film or a live opera or both? Or? Yeah, so uh, Psychomachia is a... Uh, right now, we, we only have a, a script and a pitch, but mm. it's a, supposed to be a live uh, performance with a film uh, flat. Um, so it's going to be a 2D film with the, a live music performance and then eventually we will record the performance and, and we will be able to distribute it also as a normal film. And then uh, Songs of Envy takes inspiration from Psychomachia and is a 20 minutes uh, VR live concert, opera concert. Okay, so I think if there's no more question, I think we are okay in time. So thanks to all the speakers, thanks to Martina, to Michelle, Thank you. to Jan and Radim. Do you have a, you guys in the live regie, you have some sort of slide, what's still coming? Because we are not finished yet with the whole day. Ah, yeah. So we have a break now. No, but that's not all. Yes. So the plan is that it goes on with games and art, and then AI, I think. And yes, also to mention one more time uh, the deep space screenings. 6.30 with Martina, am I right? Yeah, where you can see Egg. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, before, at 6, also a deep space screening, which is connected to uh, Rashad Newsom. Is that correct? Which, yeah. So it's a whole day of expanded animation. Thanks for coming back and have a great break.